do is this this is all about giving you guys a chance and opportunity and i hope everyone there is, is out there is doing well i hope you guys are healthy and I know everybody's ready for the fall. It, it kind of feels like everyone's ready to go, ready to rev up. So we here at Tech 2025 are getting um, back up and going for the fall after a really interesting first half of the year. I think most people would agree. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, what it is that we're doing today and how we're going to um, do this. I'm going to introduce you to our amazing speaker. He is going to give us a presentation that's going to enlighten us on this topic. Okay. Because even I, I mean, I love tech and I'm like, wow, okay, I think I get it, but I know I don't. So then more importantly, we're going to give you the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and it's really important that you guys just have at that, right? Because um, we, we're all like kind of short on time. We're working from home. And uh, after this, you will have an opportunity to engage with us more on this topic um, at coming uh, events and, and forums and stuff. So don't worry about that. So let's, let me just get right into this. Is everybody okay? Is everyone hearing me okay? Okay. Thumbs up. Thank all right. You. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> uh, this is tech. We, we are tech 2025. For those of you who don't know, we launched in 2017 in January. We are a community and a platform for professionals and companies and anyone. I don't care who it is and what you do. Um, you will have an opportunity when you come to us to learn more about the emerging technologies that are coming. So whether you're at you know, whether you are a, a software engineer, right, or someone who's just learning, we try to create events and experiences that um, enable us to have learning and conversation that brings us together, not tears us apart. And we've been doing that pretty well. And it's not necessarily because of us, it's because we have a great community of people who want to figure out the future together. So <laughs> that's kind of a, a little bit about what we do. You can go to our website and learn a lot more we have done. Um, we primarily do this through live events back in the day. And now, of course, we're doing this virtually. So this is our segue to virtual. Well, we've been doing virtual events too. We've been doing that since the beginning, but primarily live. We've done about 100 live events over the past three years, okay? And so it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, but we've learned a lot too. So Richard Schrader the third. Uh, is co-founder of Automation Intelligence, right? And uh, he is an automation expert. They also focus on and, and are experts in digital twin, or as I call it, digital twinning. Uh, Richard, you will correct me and, and help me out with that. Um, okay, because I've gone through the gamut on how, what to call it and how to call it. The bottom line with this, and the reason why I reached out to Richard and why I think it's important for us to have conversations with experts like him who are at the forefront of the jobs that are coming is that digital twinning or digital twins um, is it's here. These jobs exist. This is a growing field. It's very new. Most people don't know what it is. Um, there's a lot of dissension within the field about what it is, what it is and whatever. But we have an opportunity right now to, to understand what's needed and to fill that need and to define what that job is and more or will be and more importantly what 100 jobs of the future is about just so you guys know it's about the fact that back in the past job corporations used to tell us what the jobs were right what they what a, what the jobs are that are coming and what you need to do to prepare for them i think at this point we all realize and we probably agree to some degree that that's no longer the case um 300 something million jobs are going under um, or are going to be created in the next um, five to 10 years. We have a, an entire population of baby boomers that are retiring in the next year. And, uh, and the IRS just said that millions of jobs are basically going to be, just said this about two weeks ago, millions of jobs will be deleted from the economy in the next several years. So I don't think anyone knows what those jobs are exactly, but they're coming. And, uh, and this is about preparing for that and learning how to project what that is and to define it for yourself. So Richard will join us. Um, right now and share with us, uh, number one, what digital twinning is. Um, he has explained to me, and I love that he said this in our conversation, it's very, you know, there's no one definition of it. He's going to explain to us a day in his life as a, as a digital twin expert, and he'll just be showing us some things. And then here's the fun thing that I love, because we talked about this, two things. Number one, I'm going to ask him two or three questions before I turn it over to you guys, right? But I said to him, this is what I presented to him as a challenge, and I do this a lot with our speakers, sci-fi, right? Don't you just love how sci-fi is amazing, sci-fi films, especially at depicting future technologies, but you never see 
who or what those what those who those employees are that are running that technology that are creating those um, moments. And so I think that's really fascinating. There's something there. So I asked Richard to share with us a scene from a popular sci-fi movie where he sees that a digital twin specialist would be involved in creating that moment or participating in having a very crucial role in this. So anyway, that's going to be fun. To that end, I welcome Richard. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for having you. me, Charlie. Yeah, I'm so fun. happy to join you guys and um, happy to share my experiences and hear your questions, hear your comments. Um, totally here for everybody that's in the audience and I and, uh, can't wait to, uh, to share share about my experiences with digital twins. So, um, so a little bit about me. I started uh, a company, Automation Intelligence, uh, in April of last year. Before that, I was a digital twin engineer for a design build EPC firm who used it, um, my group essentially, to, uh, to help sort of see factories before they're built. Um, they took on very risky, therefore very lucrative projects. And so my group was uh, the group to forecast what the errors were going to be down the line and to help mitigate those problems ahead of time. Um, so that's uh, one use of a digital twin. Um, so just to start off, I, you know, I want to get to what a day in the life looks like and what the uh, the skill set is, but just to introduce a digital twin, what is it? You hear it a lot. There's a lot of buzzwords, and I think that um, it's great that there's becoming more and more emphasis around digital twins, but at the same time, it comes at the expense of confusion sometimes. So what is a digital twin, right? So a digital twin, uh, you know, on the, the trunk of a tree, if you think about it, is the uh, it's a virtual representation of a real life system, right? So it is uh, uh, as close to real world as we can get with the computer power that we have and the resources we have um, with us today uh, of the real world. So um, for my company, we focus in manufacturing, logistics, warehouses. Um, our digital twins are a little bit different than what you might see at um, GE Aviation, right? Or what you might see at Colonial Pipeline, right? Um, what we focus on uh, when we think about our digital twins is um, the physics, right? Uh, we're looking at friction, we're looking at um, center of mass, we're looking at, uh, you know, momentum and, and how things interact. Um, whereas if you were to be, again, at, you know, an aviation company you might be trying to predict uh, you know, is my engine going to blow up if a frozen turkey goes in there? Or uh, if I'm designing a pipeline and I, I put, uh, you know, a, a lot of pressure, pressurized oil, where is it going to fail? Is, you know, can it, is a pipeline going to burst? So um, a few different threads or a few different branches off this tree of what a digital twin is, but um, generally speaking, that's, uh, that's what a digital twin is. So um, so how do we use it in our organization and why did I start this company? Um, essentially a, a digital twin uh, today, what it does is, is, is it allows companies to, uh, see what a, what a new facility, what a, a, a new robot, what changing their, uh, their status quo is going to look like, what, what it's going to do. Are we making the right investment? Um, if we if we move forward with buying this specific system, is it going to create upstream issues or downstream issues around it? Um, so we can help answer those questions. A step further, which is really where the cool part starts, is we can replicate a, a system and a facility so close that we actually can sort of trick the logic systems that that run the system, right? That are are controlling a, a, the real life system into thinking they're running the real system when really, really they're running the digital twin. So I'll give you an example. We did a project about this time last year for a large e-commerce company who was preparing for the Christmas holiday as pretty much anybody knows, you know, uh, December 22nd, everybody decides to do all their Christmas shopping. And, um, and so they, they knew this and what they needed to do was to get their order fulfillment center um, up and running as quickly as possible without any risk of 
uh, November, December hitting and they're not, you know, their systems aren't connected the right way. They're, there's bugs in their code. There's problems that, that they didn't foresee. Um, so we helped them. We basically took their facility that they were in the process of uh, building out and sort of connecting in and we built it out in a digital twin. And we brought in all of the stakeholders, some people from Japan, people from Belgium, Italy, people from the US. And everybody's part in this whole facility was already connected in the digital twin. And so what we were able to do was to see, um, you know, problems where different equipment wasn't handshaking correctly, um, find where sensors weren't um, pointed in the right direction, um, all the nitty gritty details that, uh, you know, the 20% the that you can't foresee and that you typically find in the field, we were able to do that in a digital twin and it was a great um, success for them. So, uh, so that's, that's, generally what um, what it is. So I want to share my screen and I believe Charlie shared with you a um, document that was from Deloitte, which was essentially uh, Deloitte's picture on what it what it looks like to be uh, to 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 be a digital twin engineer or a digital twin specialist, if you want to call it that. Um, and so, I just want to um, kind of give you a few points and and feedback on this. Um, I think that Deloitte, much like a, you know uh, <laughs> other companies that are similar, want to get you excited about it and and sort of let the, uh, let the ideas flow. So, um, so we'll just dive right into it, right? So it talks about, um, you know, how did this come about? Why are people interested in digital twins now when they maybe weren't five or 10 years ago? Um, it really comes down to the ability that you're able to model in real time, right? So if you can't, mimic real life, the, comp the computational complexity is too complex for you to do it in real time, um, you're gonna have a really hard time uh, uh, doing anything meaningful, right? If you can't render at least in real time, it's, it's hard to, um, to do anything fruitful. So that faster computing power is absolutely a source for why this is becoming more and more, um, things are becoming more and more possible. It actually has a lot to do with Bitcoin. Um, the, the, when, when Bitcoin became so, uh, <laughs> so expensive, that means that mining Bitcoin, right, was, um, was, was so uh, lucrative and people invested so much money in, in GPUs, right? So these massively parallel um, real-time processing units and um, that investment and that leaps and bounds that came with the, you know, GPUs in the, in the last few years has made it um, what, what we're able to model and, and the, the level of detail we're able to model in digital twins that much greater. Um, so we also talk about communication across silos. So, you know, when, when the example I gave um, in, you know, without a digital twin, when you go to, um, at least within manufacturing, uh, if you make a change or you go and you build a, a new facility, there's typically six to eight weeks where you shake out all the bugs, right? I talked about the people in Germany and the people in, um, in, um, in Japan and other, other places in silos, they get, to, they get to the site and it's an expectation that everybody sort of shakes things out and it takes sometimes even several months to get it um, up and running to speed. This allows that communication to happen not only remotely, not only in a socially distanced fashion, which is great, um, but much earlier in the process, right? So it, it's, it, it frees it up um, much sooner. Um, I, I think there's a, a few things here to, to point out, especially with respect to machine learning. And I know this is not a discussion about machine learning in general, and I want to get to the rest of the, you know, focus on digital twin. But um, machine learning absolutely is a huge component um, with respect to the future of digital twins. Um, the reason why that is, is that machine learning requires uh, a gymnasium upon which to train itself, right? So machine learning, reinforcement learning, it, it essentially takes 
um, takes data and it takes a, a newborn baby, if you want to think about it, and it trains this newborn baby in a virtual world, in a, in a real life scenario, um, how to make decisions, what decisions are good, which decisions are bad. And over time, over thousands of iterations of learning, this baby matures into, into a brain that is, is really powerful and can take lots and lots of data and lots and lots of information and make really great decisions and see deep insights in real time. Um, a digital twin is absolutely necessary if you wanna do that, especially within the manufacturing logistics space. You need a realistic place to train these agents, to train your models, um, and to make sure that you're not, um, you know, you're not doing it on, uh, on data that you just made up or even only the data that you have, you can recreate streams of data very cheaply um, and, and, and farm tons of it in order to, to train your machine learning models. But I digress slightly. <laughs> um, so we talk about, you know, what skills are, um, are necessary, you know, with respect to, you know, being a digital twin, digital twin engineer, right? So what if you're going to be the person that, um, that is actually developing it from the ground up? Um, absolutely, you need to have a strong software background and a strong analytical background. I would also add to this list uh, communication, right? So communication is absolutely critical um, when you talk about the outcomes that you're getting from your digital twin. Not only do you need to, to basically compress and to summarize what, what you found or what your findings are, what your suggestions are, you need to be able to express what the limitations of your digital twin are. So if you go in and say, you know, we have a perfect, um, uh, a perfect representation of real life and it said this, uh, you, you're, you're not telling the truth and you're going to get <laughs> thrown out of the room. So it's also important to be able to express, um, you know, with, for, for my case, right, we talk about, yeah, we're in a physics-based world, you know, you, we don't have deformable bodies, right? So we don't have um, boxes that'll crush or, um, you know, bags that'll tear or bottles that'll break, but we assume everything's infinitely rigid and we go from there. And so being able to communicate that and, and, and show where your, um, where the uh, sort of limitations are of digital twins is, is uh, critical as well. I'm going to check the chat quickly and um, see if we have any questions. I'll take care of that. I don't want you, you um, feeling like you have to do too much. Don't worry. We're going to give them a chance to have questions too. I really want you to, um, get through this. And guys, by the way, if you'd like to type in a question, you can put it in the bottom or in the chat, but preferably in the bottom where it says submit a question. And I promise you, we're going to get, we're going to get to that in a couple of minutes. <laughs> okay. Does that work? Yeah, it works for me. Um, so this, this, uh, this document also goes into what are some of the tools that, um, that are used. And again, um, some of these are pipe dreams. Some of these are actually real and, and that we actually use them. I think one that, that we definitely use and one that, that um, is, is here and now is augmented reality, right? So um, with uh, Charlie mentioned, we've got an aging workforce and there's going to be a lot of tribal knowledge that's gonna need to be migrated into a platform that, um, that is usable not only for the next generation, but the generation beyond that, and potentially for unskilled labor, right? I mean, the, there's such a labor shortage now that, uh, especially on the lower tier of labor, there's so much turnover. So you train somebody, uh, they could get a dollar more an hour and they're gone, right? So this, this is a real thing, um, augmented reality. Virtual reality is another thing that is, is absolutely here as well. Um, you see it a lot with gaming. You've probably seen it on commercials. Some people, you know, might have headsets and you see people with lightsabers doing like a, 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 a guitar hero type thing. Um, but there's, there's ways, in, and we do it a lot, um, to train people on machines and uh, train people in a factory that they have yet to be in yet. Um, unskilled labor, people who do risky jobs to notice when things aren't exactly right and you should, you know, 
um, you should you should be doing uh, kind of reassessing your your thought process here. Um, that's here and, and unfortunately not listed here, but absolutely um, here and and totally valuable. Um, but again, there's there's some things in here like uh, Rosetta is a AI based real time language translator that listens to speech. Not really relevant to digital twins. I you know I can't even get Alexa to you know turn on the lights. <laughs> so um, that's not here yet. And and even if it is, I don't think that's totally. Lights. Oh. Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't we get to one meeting? I that? should have known that was going to happen. I should have known that I called that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So and and um, you know, a day in the life. Again, this is this is uh, a, a little bit romantic here, but um, I would say you know one thing that jumps out to me as absolutely um, correct here is you the the people that you're typically dealing with so and where there's the most traction in digital twins is with companies that are fortune 200 and above um, they have an r d department and they have a funded r d department these aren't just uh you know interests for uh, you know side projects for vps these are actual r d groups right so um so that's where you know, if you're, when you're looking for where are the jobs going to be, that's where the first ones are going to be. Um, absolutely. Um, we talked about that. Um, but, you know, some other things I would say here is as far as a day in the life, I mean, from, from a engineering perspective, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit more down in the weeds, right? I mean, it's, it's close to software development. Um, I would say it's, it's, it's a CS, a, a computer science job, as much as it is um, a um, as it is a mechanical industrial engineering job. So you have to be able to 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 recreate, you know, a, a real life world and where there's shortfalls or where there's things that don't exactly line up to be able to identify those and figure out why that is. We had a really interesting project um, with um, with a contact lens manufacturer last year and we could not get the process times right for a specific manual step that they uh, that they have in the, the contact lens you make a bunch of lenses and batches and things like this what we found was is that the more backlog or sort of the more the busier um the the load was for a, a human the faster they work right if they just have steady flow and it's kind of you know, um, not so busy, they work a lot slower, only as fast as they have to. And that was very difficult to model. And one of the things that, you know, as an engineer, you need to um, be able to identify and, and figure out. Um, so that's it. I mean, I, you know, another thing that, that I want to emphasize is that there's so much opportunity around digital twins and not just in an engineering sense, right? So um, for, for our organization and for organizations that are taking, you know, developing digital twins and the, the benefits you get more seriously, being able to understand the, the limitations of a digital twin, the capabilities of a digital twin, to be able to look and see a problem that you know you can fix with a digital twin is worth at least as much as that same person in an engineering role. Um, we see problems all the time when we go um, to factories, when we go to distribution centers and clients say, we, you know, here's a problem over here and, and you know, we want you to take a look at this, like, you have problems everywhere, right? Like, you have, there's so many things here that could be fixed, um, and here's how a digital twin can give you a platform, an opportunity to fix them um, without impacting you know, your, your online assets, the things that are making you money. And so, um, so that's what I would say, you know, people who want to um, familiarize themselves, you know, understand what it's capable of. You don't need to be an engineer to get into this field. If you did want to be, you know, an engineer, but you don't know where to start, I would suggest you start with, a, with Unity. Um, Unity is a great open source um, uh, package. It's, it's used in gaming a lot, but it takes... Um, it takes a lot of the uh, the power of GPUs and, and 
I think it's really going to be a future platform for digital twins and especially um, in, in, in industry soon. So um, if you're looking for a place to start in more of an engineering role, I would absolutely start there. Um, okay, so we've got just a few minutes left. I wanted to share a couple videos. Um, Charlie, nod if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. And if you, I mean, if you do, are you talking about the Matrix one? I have the Matrix queued up. I also wanted to share just a quick video. Um, so this, so a lot of the videos and a lot of the customers we have, we aren't able to share, but UPS is a customer of ours and they um, have alert, allowed us to share a few different things. Um, so this is, this is, and I'm not going to be able to go in and <laughs> explain all the things that are happening here, but I wanted to kind of give you a flavor for for what a digital twin looks like in, in real life. So, so this is a, a digital twin of a hub, essentially where if you ship a package, um, you're going to, your package is gonna go through at least one of these, if not um, more than that. And um, so we basically created a, a digital twin for them um, of an entire facility. And that's going to be where we try and learn all sorts of new technologies um, over the next uh, few months, potentially years, so. That's cool. Um, so there's that. I also wanted to share, we mentioned sci-fi. Yeah. And I was thinking about it. Um, the Matrix is absolutely an awesome example of, uh, of, of digital twins. So, if, if you guys remember the matrix, right? So the matrix is sort of itself a digital twin, right? It's, it's, it's the, the non-reality part of reality. And that's a whole nother discussion, I guess. But um, what, what we're gonna, the, the scene we're looking at here is when Neo learns to do Kung Fu. Um, so this is, this is one of the, the classics here, right? Can you guys hear it? I can hear it. All right, so I know Kung Fu. We heard that. <laughs> Show me. So we have all the bugs figured out, right? We, we're ready to start this new factory up. We've got the robotic time perfectly. Show me. OK. <laughs> So that's slightly different, right? We, we can't break the laws of physics, but. So I think we all understand kind of what, where we're going with this. He doesn't actually know Kung Fu. He thought he did. He said, I know Kung Fu, but as it turns out, he didn't know it as well. So we can think of Neo potentially here as a machine learning program, or you could even think of him as a computer program that somebody's updating using a digital twin, seeing what fails, what works, what doesn't work, and gets to try new things. So you would have been hired to go to, to create this experience or to model this experience for Neo and Orpheus. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay. this, they're, they're fighting in a digital twin right now. Oh, okay. So that's, that's what's missing from the movie is the jobs that went into... So he's like, oh man, maybe I don't actually know Kung Fu. And eventually, right, he, his program, his knowledge gets to the point to where he can, uh, Again. and we all know what happens, right? So, right. <laughs> That's so. A great. I think everyone uh, relates to that. I love that movie. And so I, I hope it's clear, guys, on why I, I asked him to give us an example of where this position would be in any sci-fi film or sci-fi film that we've seen. Thank you so much for that, Richard. I'm going to I see a couple of questions that have come in, and I just want to you know, ask them because I know we're limited on time. Two things. Number one, guys, thank you for that great presentation. Um, hi, Rich. Thank you for that great presentation. 
Uh, I will, the video will be available to you guys, so don't worry, we're gonna take questions now. Rich, so here's a question from James Jude, who is, by the way, he runs our strategy and consultancy over at Tech 2025. Um, Richard says, uh, Richard, I uh, have worked with evolutionary AI to allow AI to run massive simulations using Digital Twins physical descriptions. Evo mm -hmm. AI can often find extreme cases that one would not think to test. Um, for example, um, Evo-driven um, hydroponic food experimentation or experiment discovered that basil leaves, ooh, that basil leaves grow best in 24-hour life, a condition that human testers would never have put to a test um, or in that condition, uh, but Evo discovered by pushing the boundaries with each successful iteration. So I see what he's saying. He's, he's asking you um, uh, if you've worked with evolutionary AI in regards to this. And Yeah, so two things there. Um, evolutionary AI, yes, um, and that's where, you know, the AI is essentially coming up with what it wants to text, uh, test next and where its thought process is. Um, even without AI, what you can do is take a digital twin and do um, sort of queue up a number of experiments where you might, um, we've done projects in the past where we wanted to answer the question of how many autonomous vehicles did we need in our warehouse. Um, if, uh, you know, if we have a busy day, if we have a slow day, if we had, um, you know, to do really long hauls or just a, a lot of short things. So um, even without AI, you can use the digital twin to run massively parallel simulations and extract out results that will drive your business decisions uh, around that. Awesome. Uh, another question that we have came in from Christopher Wilch oh, Wil oh, hi Chris. Uh, he's, he's been a speaker at Tech 2025 and he's- Hey Charlie. Hey. Um, so where did you see, what do you see reality capture feeding into both the creation and usage after the fact regarding digital twins? Um, so I'm not familiar. Chris, can you elaborate on reality capture? Yeah. So I'm using it as a generic term, everything from, you know, general scanning, um, you know, photogrammetry, mm -hmm. there are, you know, vision systems now that are coming, you know, that are coming down quite a bit in cost. Um, so I was just curious, you know, where that fits both on, I would imagine the creation would speed up the, I mean, you came from the, the AEC world, so you probably saw some of the laser scanning on and, and speeding up the time to create a digital twin um, from what's existing. And then, um, and then also, I think the interesting side uh, would also be the back end of, you know, uh, what they're, you know, these, devices may be using in the simulation or theoretical devices or what you're seeing kind of being implemented um, to improve the throughput of some of these some of these uh, designs. Absolutely. So great question. Um, I'll talk about the sort of the starting point first where, uh, you know, talking about a point cloud or a 3D scan and how that can make our lives easier when we're uh, when we're creating a digital twin absolutely does. Um, you know, even better is a, a, you know, a point cloud with an existing 3D drawing, but, you know, we know, Chris knows probably better than everybody that that never exists. And even if it does, it's not um, accurate. So a point cloud is an awesome place to start when you're, you want to get a highly accurate representation of it, an existing, you know, one that's not been created uh, or one that has been created facility. I would also say to the point where, you know, when we're talking about vision systems, vision systems becoming cheaper, um, the machine learning around vision is becoming better and better and more mature and there's more players and there's more um, mature, it's becoming better. Um, and can we train our vision systems? Can we test them on digital twins? The answer is yes and no, right? So you can, um, there's some things that you can that you can render and you can get really close to real life. Shadows, uh, textures, uh, reflections of, of light off of your object. Um, but it's it's never going to be within that threshold that's going to perfectly train your machine learning algorithm. It just doesn't, right? Because because in order for a machine vision system which might look at 
Coke bottles going by and see, is it filled up to the right level or, um, you know, is there the right, you know, is there that lithium ion sticker on my package uh, or not? Because, you know, if it, if it isn't on there, you're, you're going to have a lot of fines from the government. Um, you need those to be, you know, 99.9% .9 accurate or better. And it's the, the level of detail you need uh, just isn't there yet in digital twins to be able to perfectly replicate all of those um, for a machine vision system. But great question. I, I think it'll be there soon, by 2025 perhaps. Hopefully, right? <laughs> we're, we're banking on that. Um, great questions, by the way, guys. I love this. So we have Rodney. Rodney, I'm actually going to un unmute your mic because I like hearing your guys, your voices, if you don't mind. Um, video gets a little complicated. But, uh, but he mentions that he's chief risk officer or he was chief risk officer at uh, Morgan Stanley's broker dealer and swap dealers. And he, he has a great question about fintech. Rodney, do you, do you wish to speak on that? I, I've unmuted you if you'd like. Maybe not. Okay. And it's not working for some reason. So, okay. So here's his question. He says, uh, you know, he's looking forward to the webinar. Uh, he's on a journey. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. Hoping to transition to lending FinTech or FinTech. Oh, he's introducing himself to us. Okay. That's great. Um, are you working at all in the financial space with regards to this? Do you see any kind of use, use case for this in FinTech and Probably not. What's going unfortunately, on? outside of my scope of expertise. <laughs> above my pay grade. Um, above my pay grade. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't know when I'd be uh, lying if I said I did. So I'm not sure. I'm going to ask this last question because I know we actually are running a little late, guys. So I really, I really am sorry, but I know you have great questions and you guys have stuck around. So um, here's a question. And I don't know who this is from. I apologize if you if you want to just raise your hand and let me know if it's from you or put it in the, the box. It says, uh, can you clarify how a digital twin merges with AR, VR? Are you creating the background scene um, and interaction objects and then another team makes a VR AR training experience on top of that, or do you do it all end to end? That's a great question. It is a great question. So here's, VR is the easiest. Um, and VR is, uh, yeah, VR is, 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 is the most, um, the, the shortest bridge to gap here. So when we're creating a digital, when we have this 3D uh, physics-based environment that, uh, that we're, we're running our algorithms, we're running our factory in, and um, all that VR allows you to do is get in and move around and pick up these, these objects, these, uh, you know, uh, these things that already exist, already have a mass, already have, you know, um, some amount of, of, of gravity there, et cetera, and interact with them. So you can embed uh, screens, right? So if you have uh, a computer that you're going to use at a desk, maybe you, you uh, you know, like you could imagine somebody scanning um, you out at Publix or something like that. You right. can interact with the screen with your handhelds in virtual reality. Now, an augmented reality is a little bit different because augmented reality requires the real system in order for it to be relevant. So you're, you're in HoloLens, you're actually at, um, let's say, you know, a UPS, we talked about that earlier, a UPS site, you have to be there to look around and see information that's relevant based on what you're looking at. Now, you can recreate that AR experience in a digital twin, but you have to use VR. Mm. This is really hard to think about. So you're in VR, but you're pretending to wear AR glasses in VR, and that you can do as well. It's um, it's a little bit mind boggling, but that's um, so we we have a, a project we're doing now where um, we want to help train people to stack uh, trailers of boxes together, right? So if you see a UPS truck on the road, it's full of packages. And if you take somebody off the street like me, um, I best case for somebody untrained is they could get 650 packages in a trailer. If you have somebody who's um, experienced two years or greater, they can do about 800, 850. So you think about that gap to skilled labor. What if you could make an AR program that could show people how to orient packages in a way that maximizes the number you can fit into a trailer? Take this package, orient it this way, and place it here. I mean, that's a, that's a huge, uh, huge thing. So that's one of the things we're working on with respect to AR, um, but those are, that's how it sort of plugs in. That's amazing. Um, Richard, 
everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I, I have one last question. I'm going to share the poll results. Actually, um, I just put Richard's question up because I think I, I want him to walk away with something from you guys. I want him to know something about you. And his question was, um, what's your organization's main concern for adopting AI? And the choices were no products available, number one, unclear ROI, number two, um, top new risk of failure or two, two new risks too new, excuse me, or risk of failure, right? Risk averse, um, and no budgets. <laughs> and it doesn't surprise me, unclear ROI. Unclear ROI, and here's how the digital twin ropes into this, right? Is that when we're talking about AI, we started this conversation with what is a digital twin? There's so many buzzwords is what is AI even, right? Like I, I need to see this thing. Um, so what the digital twin allows you to do is recreate your existing system to validate that, show that it meets apples to apples using the same logic, using the same rules under the same conditions as reality. So you recreate, we'll call this A, and then you take AI and you apply it here in option B, right? And now you can measure the difference between what you're already doing and what this theoretical AI module is. So you don't even have to care what it is. You don't even, before you see that it works, it, you know, you don't even have to smell it, right? You don't even have to put any time into thinking about it. And that's how you can generate your ROI. You can say, what does this thing do? Let's see it work before we even talk about dollars and cents. Um, I need to see at least a 2% increase in my throughput in order for us to even consider it. So show it to me first and then let's talk. Um, but, you know, and, and I also want to point out the, the risk of failure being a runner up here. That's another thing, right, is if it works in a digital twin, you have much more confidence than you did blindly thinking it was actually going to work. You might have somebody even at Deloitte or even at, um, you know, Accenture or Automation Intelligence say, hey, I have this AI module and I think it'll help. Um, if you have the pull to pull the trigger in your organization for AI, you don't want to look dumb. You want to you want to do all the things you can to make sure that this is a worthwhile endeavor for you, and that's what a digital twin can do is bridge that risk gap for you. Um, so, awesome! Thank you so much. Thank Richard. you for having me. I really enjoyed. Yeah. It. Yeah. Thank if, you. Everyone. If other questions? Um, find me on LinkedIn. I will. Um, but we're gonna have Here are my details. Thank you for so you guys hung around. So thank you so much for hanging around. It lets us know that you really do care about this, and you probably have a lot of feedback on this that you haven't been able. I'm saying our audience. What I will do is um, by tomorrow, which is Friday, I'm gonna send everyone um, an email. We will send you an email from Tech 2025. We will have the amazing Richard's contact information in there. We will have this video, yes, for playback. We will also include that document that we he went over. Um, from Deloitte on how they envisioned what a digital twin, you know, specialty might be or, or that, you know, which is an amazing document. And we're also going to add some other things in there and give you an opportunity to learn how to connect with us on our 100 Jobs of the Future series. Okay. So hopefully if you guys have anything else to say, um, you know, just reach out to us, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, thank you so much for joining us. All right. You guys are amazing. Oh, thank you, Zinzu. Super thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. I did too. Awesome. Have a great day, guys.